Hi, I'm Joanne Woodson, a solo practitioner specializing in commercial leasing law. I've been a lawyer for a long time, and I know that there's a lot to wrap your head around when it comes to commercial leasing. The goal of my podcast, the Commercial Leasing Diva podcast, is to make your lives as commercial leasing professionals easier and more fun. In the podcast, I speak to other commercial leasing professionals who share their expertise so that we can all improve our commercial leasing game and better serve our clients. This year's California Lawyers Association annual real property conference took place on March 24 and 25 at the beautiful Sonoma Mission Inn. The conference opened with a panel entitled Strategies for Thriving as Women Lawyers in a Post-Pandemic World. This impactful panel was moderated by Krista Mitzel and featured attorneys Sarah Nichols, Krista Kim, Sangeetha Raghunathan, and Shaheen Sheikh Sadal. This session qualified for 1.5 hours of MCLE credit for elimination of bias. Speakers shared their experiences of the effect of the pandemic on their legal and personal lives and provided useful action steps for modifying their legal practices to incorporate wellness. This episode includes some of the highlights of the panel. I've had an inflatable hot tub for the longest time. My husband was like, what is happening? This is ridiculous. I'm like, stop your judgment, just inflate it. (laughs) As well as the reaction of various attendees to the panel. I think we all learned a lot and really appreciated the willingness of the panelists to share their experiences of the effect of the pandemic on their legal practices. Many of us came away inspired to implement some of these strategy. And I know I personally am still really thinking about some of the recommendations that the panelists shared. Enjoy. So uh, in terms of the opening panel, which was really focused on women lawyers, sort of their experiences during and after the pandemic, how it affected their work and home life. Um, what were some of the key takeaways for you from that panel? It's okay to say no for your own happiness and health and well-being. The thought that people, that other lawyers couldn't discuss the fact that they had had a baby with their clients is, it's not surprising and yet still shocking. You know, working until 2 a.m. every night isn't sustainable. You know, there's articles about vicarious trauma and the fact that we um, inter- sometimes internalize what our clients tell us. And I mean, we're meeting them at, at maybe their darkest hour. Mm-hmm. And just real open, honest talk about what it's like to be a woman practicing law, having a family, you know, trying to deal with um, working remotely and knowing what your limits are. was basically for the women lawyers, it was a round table discussion where very informal people sort of shared what their life was like pre-pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic and kind of like lessons learned. So for those of you I haven't met, I'm Krista Mitzel and Joanne kindly asked me to moderate today. I run a few other women's groups and so I'm really involved in the community and love supporting women leaders. And I'm so happy there are so many gentlemen here today. So thank you to our allies for coming and learning. even though this is a focused kind of women in leasing law type event, it's so nice to be connected with lots of people because we need the men like you who care and learn and grow and are curious. So today we're talking about all of the change that has happened and how women are thriving or perhaps not. We need to be open to the fact that, you know, a lot of people are having a hard time, right? And today's really an opportunity to talk, to open up, to meet your table mates and your friends around you and to share our experiences. So we have a fabulous panel today that's going to share their experiences and how they have grown and learned and really evolved as leaders during this time. Well, this one in particular, because of its focus on women and really making sure, I know you put a lot of effort into getting a lot of women speakers, that was definitely different. The last time I went, it was all older gentlemen of a particular racial persuasion. So it was nice to see right. some diversity. It was really amazing because I think that, especially in the world of real estate, it tends to be very male heavy. And it was the first time I was really in a, a setting where there were so many professionals that were also females and had more in common with me in terms of 
my career trajectory and the balances and juggling act that I make in my career. Because there were four really, well, five really knowledgeable um, peers on the podium, uh, I really felt like I'm getting the best quality information from people in my position. Uh, right. And so their kernels of takeaways um, that they had concluded, um, I could then draw the parallel with myself to say, yeah, I'm in that position or, huh, I never thought about it that way. Example, a lot of my clients are women over 40 in sales and a lot of the way that they operated was very much in person. And, and so when that was kind of limited, that had a massive impact on their career. I think um, there's a lot of women who had a lot of opportunity for more lead than ever before in their careers at like the large tech companies. And I'm seeing a lot of women who took leave be part of the massive layoffs. I've been at DC for much of my career and you know, unfortunately I've had to do a lot of roofs and lay off a lot of people, right? And sometimes for performance. And I remember when we would do, before the pandemic, I remember we would, you know, we wanted to let somebody go and part of the, when we look at the job description, like what did it require? And a lot of it was like, you must be on site. Right, like, and it wasn't, it wasn't the like, uh, the receptionist for the person in the front. So I get intakes every day, um, probably about 10 to 20 people call me with an issue. And in the last couple of months, it's been a bit of a deluge of people, like people that have through the layoffs. And I remember what, like, one of the things that we used to lay off this individual at, at a former role was that person just hadn't come into work in a while. I said, no, well, the requirement job description says this. And I've seen a pattern a lot of women have experienced because they took leave, um, where these companies offered very generous leave policies, and then on the back end, that's come to impact them. And men, because more men were taking leave than ever before. And just seeing that uh, retaliation happening on a large scale. You know, there's a lot of people that have, you know, like their life, family, or they have a disability, right? And that, like, those people were subject to JDs where it said you had to be on site and that was sometimes used as a way to say well, look you're not performing the requirements of your job right like it wasn't a comp like, we would go through this whole accommodation process and then like somehow you know we would they would end up leaving I think women right now and post pandemic are kind of feeling you know how do I manage and navigate and not be part of layoffs how do I develop my own uh, career path my favorite clients that come to me are usually the ones that come in tandem where they're really supporting each other. The solution is collectively a lot of times. And they're like, hey, we've got this situation and the three of us are all experiencing it and we wanna kind of work together to solve it and help and stay employed. I remember asking the CEO of the company that I was at, you know, why there weren't more women in leadership there. And, you know, he told me that, well, it's because they, they leave and they go have babies, you know, right. and, um, and that was <laughs> kind of shocking and upsetting to me at the time. When I was working in big law, I remember coming back from maternity leave with my second child and um, I, I was, I had to really campaign to be allowed to work from home one day a week. And that was one right. thing that I really felt like would make a big difference in my life. And it was such a strange ask at the time. One of the things when I talk to women associates a lot is I, you know, I say it's it's very helpful to not let the law firm old fashioned metric weigh you down and to really look at your life and your professional career as there are going to be phases and it's a general upward trajectory in your profession. You will get better and better and better as time goes by, but there will be times when you might step back a little bit. Um, because you have other life commitments that are important to you, but your firm should not penalize you for that. Mm. Your firm should accept that everyone has cycles and that there may be a time when you work part-time or you take a leave, but then you come back and you should be respected uh, yeah. and encouraged and yeah. taken back and put back on the track. And, you know, and that was so not the case when I was coming up. I remember like people were like, what, you want to work from home on Fridays? I was like, yeah, let me, you know, work from home. I'll get the work done. I'll stay on task. And it was such a, and now it's like a given, like, yeah, everybody right. can work from home. Yeah. I remember, and I have this client who 
she's actually a good friend of mine now. She didn't really know I had, she didn't know I was pregnant. She didn't know I was going into labor. I didn't tell her. <laughs> had the baby, the babies, I don't know. She must have been like a week old. All of my children were exceptional sleepers, all the best babies. So I have three of them. <laughs> so easy. Um, the baby was literally sleeping on me and wearing one of those little baby carriers. The client calls me, me or texts me, needs to have a call. I'm, like, I'm holding the baby, she's napping. I didn't tell her I had a baby. <laughs> so, you know, I decided to call her, baby's sleeping, not gonna know. Um, having the call with her, baby starts to wake up, I just mute it, make a noise. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Later I told her the story, it was really funny. She's like, I cannot believe you did not feel like you could tell me that you had a baby. But I didn't, I felt like I couldn't because I had to, you know, keep it straight. I'm gonna meet my deadlines. I don't want her to feel like, why am I working? The reality is that the work that we do it doesn't need to be nine to five. Right. Um, and in fact, it's not. No. It's not nine to five. No. As we very well know, clients do not expect that at 5.05, you are unavailable until tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. That, that's not going to fly. And I'll say I had three children. You know, my second child, I was in the office with my baby who I, you know, made a nursery in my office because I could. Um, when she was three years old, they had these really sweet pictures, but looking back, like, I don't want that for my team. You know, I don't want that for other people, even though I could do it, because I could do anything. You know, it's not just because I can do it, it's not um, necessarily- Well, right. is it healthy, right? No, it's not. Because I did the same thing. Baby number two, I was on the phone, I think like seven hours later. And I look back and I'm like, crazy bitch, what were you doing? Like the attitude that your former boss had was very typical. They just would throw their hands up. We just don't know. They just have babies. And they, they don't think about the fact that, you know, a woman went away for three months with maternity leave and came back and no one would give her work. No one right. would take her seriously because right. she's a mommy and she can't possibly have a brain in her head anymore. And obviously she's just going to get pregnant and leave again. So why invest time in her? These very, mm -hmm. very old fashioned ideas, which hopefully as more and more women come into leadership are really being tossed out the window. The practice of law is not a nine to five job. So it's just not like I have clients who email me and they're like, you know, it's nine o'clock at night. Can I get this by tomorrow afternoon? It's not a nine to five job. So there is an inherent level of stress involved. And, and I, and that the thought that people, that other lawyers couldn't discuss the fact that they had had a baby with their clients is it's not surprising and yet still shocking. So I'm glad. I'm glad that that's gone. I'm kind of an open book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would have told everyone. You know, there's this generational split, you know, so the oldsters like me who are like, you go to a law firm and you suck it up and they treat you like crap and that's just life, get over it. As opposed to the younger generation who, you know, someone in my position might say, geez, they were whinging all the time. When in fact, they're sort of standing up and saying, take it. Like, I believe that the workplace should be humane and kind and compassionate. And of course, I find that irritating because of course, I was not able to stand up for myself, right? And demand that. But of yeah. course, I believe that. It's not like I don't believe it, but it's that I didn't have that courage at such a young age to make that demand. Well, I think that there was a lot of work put in by previous generations and by the more practiced attorneys. Our firm is over 90% women and a good number of the women on our firm, I'm saying that attorneys and support staff, the entire firm, um, <clears throat> a good number of uh, people on our team um, had young children at home, including myself, three young children. I think my generation, we definitely recognize that and we want to build on that. It was very challenging, you know, all of a sudden going into a situation where it's remote schooling. Um, I remember I had a nanny who said, I just read the order and I'm actually not allowed to be your nanny anymore. I was like, what do you mean? So I was like reading the law to see if there was an exception, like for lawyers, for tax, tax attorneys, <laughs> not for me. Um. We see, you know, the trailblazing that was done, particularly among women attorneys. Um, and we look at that and we don't wanna go back. And that I think is one of the hardest things, um, you know, when women are trying to juggle work-life balance. One thing that we've done in our firm is um, we've actually, um, our practice is not so siloed where each attorney just kind of does their own thing and 
um, like we can actually come in and out of each other's uh, matters if necessary. We want to continue forward. And so we want to keep pushing that envelope of, you know, how do you support um, women to get into partnership? How do you support women to become owners in the law firm? And I'll say that in September of last year, I took my very first in my entire legal career vacation where I did not check email once wow. for two weeks. And it was, uh, it's sad we have to clap for that. I right? know. It is, it is. So talk to us about your journey coming to your why. So I was very inspired when you told me about that. Yeah, the why. Um, yeah, so, so just to get really raw here for a second, right before the pandemic, I lost my mom. She was very, we were very, very close. And so for me, the pandemic was like way too much time because I had a lot of grief to sit with. Like there was collective world grief and then my personal grief and dealing with my children's grief. There was a lot happening. And I think I, took the time because I wasn't running around driving the kids everywhere, right? Nobody was going there. I was like, well, I have a lot of time back on my hands. And um, I took that time to figure out like, okay, like we don't have forever here. And so what do I want to do with this very powerful tool called a law degree in America, right? Like what can I use this for? And so I actually got a side letter from a, a venture capital firm. And then it was like, normally they ask for things like sweeteners in the deal, right? Founders want to, can you give us something extra? This was a seven page manifesto on DEI. And it was asking my clients and founders to um, commit to the mission of being diverse, equity, inclusive, all that stuff. I was like, Shh, close your eyes and sign it. It's the best side that I've ever read in my you know, 15, 20 years of practice. And I thought, well, why haven't I seen that ever before? I've had my own firm doing this kind of work for 16 years, and that was the first time I saw it in the middle of a pandemic. And then I started doing a review of my practice, and I looked at all the deals I had done, and I had never had a woman lead investor. Then I started reading the statistics, and Krista touched upon this. So in, in 2021, we deployed $330 billion of capital and venture capital, and only 2% of that went into women, 2%. And I was pissed. <laughs> um, and the statistics are not greater. So in 2022, we deployed less capital. I think it's like 240, but still only 2% went to women. So if you look on, if you start Googling, they're like, oh, it, it kind of went up percentage wise. It really didn't, right? And if you look at people of color, it's even smaller. Oh, it gets worse. If you start dialing down by, you know, women of color or particularly black and Latinx women, forget it. It's, it's depressing. So, I just thought, well, I have time because I'm not driving the kids here and there and everywhere. Um, and my husband thinks I can't possibly do it on my own anymore, so he was cooking a lot. And I decided I was going to make it my mission to recraft my practice um, to really focus on getting women money. And I basically spent that time, like, I guess maybe empowered by the kind of mom my mom was and the kind of woman she, she was and wanting to, to honor the legacy she left behind and me and, and then looking at my women clients and, and seeing their struggle you know, as founders and knowing we can do better than 2%. I mean, we're in the middle of this Me Too thing and 2% of women are getting funded, that's, that's horrifying. So that was my why, that's my why and I welcome all of you to join my why. I love it. <laughs> I did something in the middle of the pandemic where I decided to leave my GC job. And then I remember, um, and I didn't have another job. And I did that on purpose. Um, <laughs> and so I remember I, I was uh, uh, leading up a panel at, at Tech GC, which was you know, a conference for uh, Tech GC, a very straightforward name. And um, you have to introduce yourself. So I stood up and I said, um, my name is Sangeeta Raghunathan and I'm the GC of nothing. And I have never in my life gotten more applause. Which, I mean, to me, indicated like everybody needed to do nothing. Like it was so important. I thought Sangeeta's perspective about being in-house counsel and deciding just to take a break with no plan to take a pause, pause as we say in Italy, but honestly, like I did nothing. It was really hard for me after 20 years to like not take a job. And I'm, you know, I'm 
I don't, I'm, I shouldn't be insecure, I suppose, but like I was insecure. I'm like, am I gonna ever get a job again, right? Like if I quit, like who's gonna hire me again, right? Like I have to be employed to get employed. I had a ton of like nervousness around that, but then finally I was like, you know what? It's gonna, I just have to do this. The the opportunity or, or the that place where she got to where she just said, nope, I'm, I can, I can step off this train for a minute and I can get back on later. And I think I just let myself experience all these like very unpleasant feelings, which like to your question, like I know this is not a joyful answer, but it will end no, up but like growth because, comes in discomfort. Because, like, once I stopped, got through all that stuff, and then I started to enjoy what I was doing, which I was just really doing nothing. I had a lot of Agatha Christie and murder mysteries, is a big genre, by the way, people. Very, very interesting. <laughs> and I think a lot of us don't give ourselves permission to do that. And right. it's too bad because taking that pause really can energize you. And she was really great at describing that and spending time with um, her family. And it was this, it kind of spanned the summer. I have a 14 year old daughter. And, you know, so I was like, hey, want to go get boba tea? And she was like, mommy, we've never had boba tea before. And I was like, what am I doing that I've never taken you? Like, do you not know what boba is? Like, I don't want other children to like bully you because you're boba bullying. Like, was like, she's like, no, I know what boba is. Like, get out. But, you know, I just tried to do these things that I guess I'd never done before with her. And it was really fun. Normally, she just, they don't seem so important, and yet they are, right? Right. Go, going um, out for ice cream or just whatever it is, is so important. For me, it really was like, what's family? And who are your friends and what are your neighborhood? That was a really cool piece because it was heartbreaking. I love those kids. And it taught me to communicate really clearly with them how much I love them and how much we need them. And I think that has been one of the things I've really focused on, um, particularly because I have not little kids, but younger, they're 10 and 12. I tried to do it in my sort of Aussie way, which was different to their way, but it still did it. Like, I love you, you know, kind of way. Um, I'm here for a hug, and that was not what they were. <laughs> Didn't do that. And I just want them to know that that joy has to be as integrated in their life um, as all the other emotions. And so um, making that a priority, right? Like taking time out, having fun, being silly, taking trips that we normally would be like, oh yeah, we'll get to it. Um, just doing it. Doing, doing it. it, yeah. yeah. You know, I had to kind of find a balance, but it's paid off and the relationship's better than ever. When she said, when you think of yourself and complain about somebody else, is it because you're jealous? Right, so I pay attention to what was pissing me off, where I was irritated where I, there was something else that someone had that I wanted, but maybe I was just reacting by being negative. Then turning that into like, okay, so how do I get that? And I thought, wow, I never thought of it that way. I've had an inflatable hot tub for the longest time, like 2017. <laughs> I, bought, I bought a real one and got it craned in, right? Like my, my husband was like, what is happening? This is ridiculous. I'm like, stop your judgment, just inflate it. Like that was the first thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know what? About 10 years prior, the gay guys down the street had craned in a hot tub and I had ridiculed them, but it was because I wanted that. I'm gonna really take note of that, which is really kind of a mindfulness practice to take right. note of things as they are happening and think, why? So pay attention to what you want, not just serving everybody else, not just serving your community and your church and your family and your cult or your, you know, nonprofit, whatever you're, you know, those are all good things except for the cult to serve, but like figure out what fills you up, what brings you joy and, and do it regularly. And it's hard, especially if you haven't done it at first. It's like trying to do a push up. It's really hard, but develop that muscle because you're going to need it in the future. You're going to need it to have your friends have that too. Right. And, and that's an elimination of bias um, and, and an exact principle of elimination of bias too. When you react in a certain way, why? That was really what I did. And I can tell you that like, I, I sometimes even write on a post-it. These are the things that bring me joy. Like so, and I have it on my computer and I kind of go, maybe I need to, to book that message. Bring more joy to your life. Like find little ways to have fun. Just now I spend, you know, one week in a month where I have nothing scheduled. And I love it, absolutely love it. And then you're energized and you can come back and you, you 
you know, you're willing to take on those projects again. It's really difficult as a young partner, right? I've been a partner for about a year now to turn any client away. Um, it hurt, hurts your soul, right? But at the same time, you know, working until 2 a.m. every night isn't sustainable. And mm -hmm. not only that, it's a disservice to your own clients that you currently have because, you know, you might be tired working on their document. I felt like that was a big takeaway from me that, you know, your health is priority and that's something that, you know, you should focus on and it's okay to do that. You know, as a solo practitioner, it's hard sometimes because you lose that uh, opportunity to socialize with your peers and, you know, walk down the hall and pick someone's brain when you have a legal question. And, and I really found that um, most people who were there really wanted to connect and share advice and life experience with one another, which um, was tremendous. I have like a WhatsApp chat now with a, with a group of women and and luckily, you know, where I'm at now, there are women owners. Um, I'm regularly in meetings where it's, you know, multiple women, partners, owners, um, associates, et cetera. So there is that representation there. I started my career at Star Finley when it first formed in 1998. So I've worked with Eric and Julie ever since then. And I'm probably one of the few people you'll meet who's worked at the same law firm for 25 years. and. A big part of the reason why I worked at the same law firm for 25 years was because I didn't have that stuff that you're talking about. I, I had friends who worked at big firms, and so I knew it existed, but I didn't have that where I worked. And so that was a big part of me staying was quality of life. I mean, when I was a young associate, there was time when Eric was like, you're taking a vacation, pick two weeks and get out of here. With the right support in a law firm and the right culture, then that's definitely possible, but it has to be part of the culture. Right. Um, it's not something right. that you can just say you're gonna do. Um, it has to really be something that you live. You know, so I didn't, I never had that issue. Um, we were always very, it was a very collaborative environment. We were always very aware of what was going on in each other's lives. If there was something happening, the team really stepped up to take care of it. So, so I was, incredibly fortunate with the firm that I landed at. That was a great takeaway, I felt. And um, I, I'm, I'm putting it to use this week. I've already <laughs> referred out a client, a potential client. So. I also did that where, um, you know, I, I think the other part of, of turning away clients is we in real estate, which is very cyclical, especially if you represent tenants, often it's a one-off. Yeah. So, you know, who knows where the next tenant is coming through the door. And so to turn away work, what if next week you have no work, right? So there's this constant fear, especially for me as a solo, and I know you're in a small firm, so always have that worry. But, you know, I was approached about a new matter and I was feeling very, you know, just had come back from the conference, feeling very overwhelmed with catching up. And I thought, could I do it? I could do it, but I thought, I don't want to do it. I don't want to add to my plate right now. And I thought back to those panels on stress and I thought, you know, there are plenty of lawyers out there who would be happy to take it on. And I'm turning away one lease that, you know, will not take that long. It's not big project in the scheme of things. But even then I was at the little niggly, like, I was like, nope, you can be a, a type B plus person. <laughs> Quote of the day. <laughs> I'm excited to announce that registration is now open for the 2024 Real Property Law Retreat and Ninth Annual Women in Commercial Leasing Law Symposium, which will take place in Palm Springs from March 8 to 10. Please uh, check out the website. We've got the full program up there. There will be four great commercial leasing seminars, as well as seminars on federal Indian law, and many other great real property topics. I hope to see you there. The podcast is sponsored in part by Commercial Leasing Law Seminars. This is my online platform where I offer e-courses in commercial leasing topics. I have two courses on the AIR form leases. My next course, which is a combination of pre-recorded videos and weekly Zooms, will launch on January 22nd. 
This is the third time I'm offering the course. I've had really positive feedback on the course, which is a deep dive into letters of intent as a vehicle for learning commercial leasing basics. And then finally, I'm very excited to be launching my newest course, which is on drafting and negotiating commercial leases. We will be doing a deep dive into all the basic provisions of a lease. And if you're familiar with commercial leasing, you'll know that's a lot, <laughs> um, but we're gonna really break it down in this six week course and provide you with lots of guidance on how to really up your commercial leasing game. So I hope to see you at the annual conference and I certainly hope to see you as well in some of my courses.